there exists something that can undo their salvation. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. So there are two key questions that I want to address in this message uh, to help true believers in Jesus Christ, those who are reborn, born again in Jesus Christ, regened, however you want to put it, a biblical Christian as it's defined in the Bible. I want to address uh, uh, this message to help true believers to know uh, that they are secure in Jesus Christ. The two questions, and we're going to have a lot of questions this morning because questions lead us to answers. Amen? But the two questions are, what happens to my salvation if I keep on sinning? And the second one, how can I ever hope to find freedom from sinful habits? They sort of go together. Can a person know? Can a person know with certainty whether they are saved or whether they are lost, whether they are secure in Jesus Christ or they could lose their salvation somehow, some way? Well, let me just say right at the beginning, Lord Jesus Christ himself said we can indeed know and be assured of our salvation, not because of us, but because of how we are saved. And so the importance of eternal security uh, is important in our lives. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10, if you haven't done so. And in verse 1, if you're there, look up. If you're not there, don't look up. Verse 1, it says, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Will be what? Saved. Jesus is the, he's the gate here, but he is also the good shepherd. He is also the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> okay. I think we need to rehearse these a, a little bit. <laughs> Okay, verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So Jews and Gentiles alike will come to know Christ the Savior and be part of his family. That's what he's talking about. If we haven't trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, if we haven't confessed that we are sinners in need of his finished work at Calvary, then maybe we need to question our relationship with you. But Lord, for those of us who have gone to you in sincerity and we've prayed to you, you have regened us. You have made us from going from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. We don't have to climb again in uh, a womb in order to be alive again. It's once for all, the just for the unjust. So, Father, help us to understand our eternal security in Jesus Christ. For those who maybe are wondering or wandering, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts, especially this morning, so that we can glorify you and be effective witnesses for you, I pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. 
Now, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit will always bring assurance to the believer in, in, in Christ that he or she is a forgiven child of the Lord. The person who does not believe in eternal security uh, of their salvation has doubts about salvation, and they also, therefore, have doubts about God, his character, his integrity, his love, his mercy, and his ability to forgive. God forgives this, but he doesn't forgive that. He can forgive her, but not me. Because he doesn't know, you know, just uh, sure he knows everything about you, and yet he still loves you. The person who does not believe in eternal security of this salvation has doubts. But the Bible is clear. God wants you to know that you are eternally secure in Jesus Christ and that he is a loving, forgiving, gracious, merciful God whose mercy has no end. Therefore, the importance of eternal security cannot be overstated. Today, I want to touch on three aspects of eternal security. First of all, it lets me know that I am saved now. It's not something that happens down the road. It's not something that happened in the past and diminishes. Eternal security helps me know that I am saved now. Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. If, if you ever wonder about your salvation, could I urge you to read through Romans 8 about 50 times? Take your time. Break it down. Use a commentary. But Romans 8, verses 37 through 39 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, including you, John Wheeler, can be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. His love is an eternal love. By the way, do you like the new screen? I mean, the new projector? Can you see better? Yes. If you saw the one from last week next to this one, there's a big difference. It really is. Also, new sound, uh, and hopefully new, new souls saved as a result of this type of an investment. It's clear that Romans 8 is focused on the believer's safety in Christ, on the certainty of their sanctification and salvation by grace. Paul says in this passage, what? I kind of wonder, I, I vacillate that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. Does he say that? Or does he say, I am persuaded, I am confident. Nothing can separate saved people from God's love. That's exactly what he says because it is a divinely inspired way to affirm a believer's salvation in Jesus Christ. God is using Paul to tell you and to tell me and any, anyone who trusts Christ the Savior, you are eternally secure because of what Jesus Christ has done because we are saved by grace. It is a gift of God. You receive it. You can't lose it. In John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall what? Never, Never perish. Never perish. What does that mean? Never perish. Never perish. Eternal life. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. If you are saved and you are in the palm of his hand, you are secure in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is a gift. If you have it, self, if, if you have it, if you have salvation, you have it eternally. You cannot lose it. Verse 28 says what? And I give them eternal life until they sin, until they commit. There's no condition there. Do you see it? Can I have an amen? amen? Did I lose power? Test one, two, three. Here we go. We have eternal life. Let that sink in. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 25. It says this. Would you read it out loud, please? Hey, 
ask you a question. Are you seeking after him or what he can give you? Are you seeking after him in a relationship or stuff? Now, I'm not talking about a new car or $100,000. Just stuff that you think, if I have it, my life will be a little bit better. Is there anything that's taking priority over your relationship with God? Because he says here, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Let me get a bit personal. Have you ever questioned God's ability to forgive you or someone you consider a repeated uh, sinner? Where does that come from? It comes from the fact that a lot of times we place human attributes onto God. You know, we think, well, my mom, my dad, oh, certainly not your mother because it's Mother's Day, but my dad, my siblings, teachers, others who have been in my life, they had a hard time forgiving me. They weren't always loving to me. They, they didn't always show me grace. And so we've been hurt in the past, and so we transfer that onto God. Are you seeking him? Or something else? Or are you holding back something from him that he wants to deal with in your life? We witness the inability of people to forgive. And so we place that on God. And so sometimes we have a hard time wondering, does God love me? How in the world can I be eternally secure when a holy and righteous God sees my heart, my mind, my brain, my thoughts? The Apostle Paul in, the first, in his first epistle in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, says this, Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who what? Believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He wasn't just the Spirit. He was a man, fully God, fully man. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Those born of God have overcome the world. Who overcomes the person who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Who testifies that this is true? God himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There you see a doctrine of the Trinity. Some people say you don't find the Trinity in the Bible. Well, there it is. The importance of eternal security is, number one, it lets me know that I am saved now. And number two, it lets me know that I am saved forever. That is, and listen carefully, it addresses my sin problem. I have another question for you. Now wait till you look up because some of you are writing. I know you're filling in those blanks. We have a contest, by the way. Uh, it's an informal contest. If you can fill in the blanks correctly before I preach, uh, you get an extra cup of coffee in, during coffee fellowship downstairs. <laughs> There's somebody here who does that, and uh, I think it's neat. But I have a question, and I hope you see it as rhetorical. Is a person saved only as long as that believer does not sin? It's not a trick question. It's rhetorical, meaning there should be an obvious answer. Is a, a person saved only as long as that believer in Christ doesn't sin? Of course not. You and I are court exhibits A through Z. How many of us here are perfect? Mothers are today, but most other, day, other days we're not. While in these bodies, while we are on this planet, we will battle with sin. We will battle with temptation. We will battle with all kinds of thoughts. Satan will try to rattle our cage. We are all familiar with what Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write in Romans chapter 7 <clears throat> when he said, look, that which I want to do, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I do do. And so he says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he, he changes his thoughts from himself and his own thinking and his own selfishness and his wretchedness. And then he remembers, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He remembers God will deliver him. Paul's self-disclosure clearly illustrates that even though the Holy Spirit indwells a believer in Christ, we Christians remain physical and affected by our flesh who often do what we want to do instead of God's will. We fulfill our will on earth and we do what we don't want to do and fail to do what we want to do. Can anybody relate to this? Can I see a show of hands so that I can be comforted that I'm not the only one? Yeah, okay, thank you. Eternal security is important because it lets us know that we are saved now and we are saved forever despite this sin issue that we battle with. And it addresses my sin problem by acknowledging that I am saved by grace through faith, <clears throat> but I have a sin problem while I am in the flesh. God is aware of that. It's not like God said, Oh, I had no clue that after they got saved, they would still sin. Did he? Or did he? No. Of course. What sins did Jesus die for? We talked about this last week. All our sins. Past, present, future. Amen? <clears throat> Paul wrote three verses that many of us are quite familiar with. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All what? All human beings, from Adam and Eve. <clears throat> then Romans 5, 8. But, I love buts in scripture. And I mean with the B-U-T. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, what happens? Christ died for us. He didn't say, clean your act up, John, and then I'll die for you. He said, Become a sinner no more and I'll die for you. While we were still sinners, God showed his love for us by sending his son to die in our place. Paul also wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens me. Strengthens me. Now what these three passages tell us is that after we, have, we are saved, we are still going to sin. This is not heaven. We live in a fallen world with fallen bodies and are not yet made perfect in Christ. There's no perfect Christian. There's no perfect church. We all desire to be perfect. We all desire, I hope, to be more like Christ and to obey him in all ways. But while on this planet, that's not going to happen. So... God's grace is extended to us and his forgiveness is extended to us when we sin after salvation and when we fall short of God's perfect plan. But, that's, but, but let's not take that as a license to sin or an excuse to sin. We're going to cover that next week. The truly saved person will not want to sin, will not desire to sin, will have a sorrow at the thought of it because that's what put Christ on the cross. Remember those saved, we suffer the consequences of sin. We can choose, we have free will on what to do and what not to do, but we don't get to choose the consequences of our sins. The importance of eternal security is that it addresses also Jesus once for all sacrifice. Romans chapter six, verse 10 says what? Would you read it please? So I have two more questions for you. Are you ready for these? Spot quiz. Number one, how many times does Jesus have to die? Oh, okay, tougher question. You ready for this? How many times can a person be born again? See, doesn't it make sense? The obvious answer should be immediate, only once. Romans 6.10 says for the death he died, he died once Sin, uh, died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. 
Yet the sad thing is those who believe that they can lose what Jesus obtained at Calvary seem to put themselves somehow in a position of crucifying him over and over again and again. In order to be saved, he needs to be crucified. This is done in one denomination of Christianity, where every time they have a mass, they re-crucify Lord Jesus Christ and re-sacrifice him. He died once, the just for the unjust. You don't have to do it again. He's off the cross. He is resurrected. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf. We do not have to re-crucify him. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, verses 8 through 11 says this. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, and who's he writing to? Christians in Rome. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Yeah, you have a body, but you are now spiritually alive. You were spiritually dead. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. <clears throat> and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What kind of life does the Holy Spirit have? Is it temporary or is it eternal? eternal. So if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you have eternal life. Got it? Good. You see, Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross was definitive, and the work of the Holy Spirit is also definitive, bringing about a new spiritual birth to the person who believes in Jesus Christ as Savior. How many times must God, the Holy Spirit, rebirth a person? Only once. Just as we are born once physically, we are born once spiritually. In Romans 8, verses 8 through 11, wherever God, the Holy Spirit, dwells, he brings eternal life because he, he is eternal. He does not depart from the saved person. Hebrews 10, 10 says this. And we're seeing a third way uh, of the importance of eternal security. It lets me know that I'm safe forever, and it also addresses Christ's sufficiency. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By that we have been sanctified, that is set apart, no longer in the world, we have set aside for him the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Does that sound pretty definitive? Was Christ's death sufficient? If we have to add sacraments, if we have to be baptized, if we have to be confirmed, if we have to do other things in order to really be saved, and then there could be purgatory for a period of time, then what, in essence, we are saying was that Jesus Christ was an inadequate Savior. And he is not. Scripture is very clear that he was sufficient to take care of the sins of the world, past, present, and future. So that begs some more questions. If you believe you can lose your salvation... How many sins do you need to commit in order to do that? Is it one? Is it 12? Is it 24? Is it God gives you grace up until you hit 1,000? How frequent must that sin be? It's daily, weekly, monthly? How long will God be patient? Does he say, I'm going to cut him off after 40 days? Again, Hebrews 10.10 10 says what? By that we will have been sanctified, have been. We are sanctified, set apart. We are there through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You don't have to go through all of that. Lord Jesus' death was totally sufficient to pay your whole sin debt in full. To say you can negate your salvation by your sin automatically cheapens Jesus' death on the cross and indicates that you believe that he's an insufficient savior. It is also falsely saying something else must be added to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to obtain salvation. To find this truth, look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. The Bible says, He then would have had to suffer often because the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once... But after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In Hebrews 7, verses 26 through 27, it talks about how he is a high priest and how he's fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Is that secure? The Bible also says, maybe you're getting tired of scriptures, uh, but I want you to see that the Bible is clear about eternal security. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For who? For those who trust Christ as Savior. How long? Eternally. Redeemed. The price was paid for. Galatians 2.15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. <clears throat> Maybe I'm too simple-minded. I do not understand why people try to pay for salvation that is a gift from God by grace through faith. Why would you want to pay for it when all you have to do is receive it? Is Jesus inadequate? Maybe it's pride. Maybe we feel, you know, we're reluctant to receive something we haven't worked for. Maybe we're not good receivers. God has clearly revealed in his word that in man's fallen state, we are precisely in the position of having to be receivers. We can't earn salvation on our own, so we must receive it by faith. Salvation costs Jesus life. It was a high price, but God offers it to us as a gift if we believe in Christ and receive salvation by faith. Therefore, we ought to never take our salvation lightly and acknowledge we could never earn it. Jesus paid the price in full for our salvation. So the third aspect of the importance of eternal security is that it has practical implications in my life. If you are not secure in your salvation, could I submit to you, you're probably not secure in life. You're wondering, when is God going to drop the hammer on me? When is God going to take me out at the knees? Everybody else has done it. If you're secure in the Lord, you have hope and joy and peace and patience and, whoa, what's that called? The fruit of the Spirit. It's coming out of you. The third aspect of the importance of eternal security is the fact that eternal security has a direct bearing on your daily life. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you will be constantly striving to keep your salvation, which often leads to anxiety and a false sense of righteousness. Or, on the other hand, you will feel the futility of your efforts being forced to face the fact that you have not led a sin-free life since you believed in Christ. It is impossible to maintain joy and hope if you are not secure in Christ. But the Lord doesn't want you to live like that. He wants us to live in peace. He wants us to know that we are secure in Christ, eternally secure in his love, in his grace, and in his faithfulness, and in his forgiveness. Now, God can and will use your sin to discipline and to train you in the ways of righteousness. He desires that we become Christ-like, but he will never strip away your salvation or your heavenly home. That is secure in Scripture. Eternal security will not only impact your daily life, it will also impact your witness for Jesus Christ. If you believe you can lose your salvation, how will you convince other people to be born again? Those who believe a person can fall from grace often have a very difficult time motivating themselves to witness actively about Christ because in their mind there's a catch. You can receive it, but you can lose it. So I'm not as intense or fervent with regard to sharing my testimony. In sharp contrast, those who are eternally secure in Christ tend to have a confident assurance and an exuberance in witnessing. 
because they believe and trust and know that they're offering an incredible salvation, an incredible gift of God to the sinner. It's because they are truly and fully forgiven. They understand it is Jesus alone who saves and it is Jesus alone who, maintain, who maintains our salvation. 1 John chapter 5 says this. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? So that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Sounds to me like God wants us to be secure in him. Amen? Amen. 1 John 2 says this, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have what? advocate with the Father. Who is this advocate? Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the payment, the satisfaction for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Now let me show you this same passage in the Living Bible. It says this, my little children, I am telling you this so that you will stay away from sin. But if you sin, there is someone to plead for you before the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the one who is all that is good and who pleases God completely. He is the one who took God's wrath against our sins upon himself and brought us into fellowship with God. And he is the forgiveness for our sins and not only ours, but the, all the world's. If Jesus is your ad advocate, if Jesus is your savior, and if he's pleading for you, how can you lose how can you lose in life? How can you lose with regard to salvation? Could I challenge you to seriously ask God this question? Lord, show me how my attitude towards eternal security is affecting my life and my witness for you. If he answers you in a positive way, keep it up. I'm securing you. I'm an effective witness for you. If it's negative, repent. Agree with God what he says about eternal security in your life. And change the way you behave in that area. Does that make sense? Are you secure in Jesus Christ? Amen. Next week. It, again, Lord willing. Is eternal security a license to sin? Once I get saved, I can do whatever I want. The obvious answer to that is? Yeah, ask Val. Let's pray. Father in heaven, talked about a lot of stuff this morning, showed a lot of scripture. And I pray, Father, that I was a tool that you used to proclaim your message. Now I pray earnestly that your word would have its intended purpose in every single one of our lives. May we know that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you will not turn your back on us. But sometimes, Lord, when we go to you in prayer, you tell us to wait or not yet. But sometimes you say no because it's not the best for us. So, Lord, may we rejoice in the salvation that's ours in Jesus Christ. May we choose to love you. May we choose to trust you. May we choose to live our lives in a way that glorifies you when things are going well and when things are well, challenging. We need your help in all areas, Father. And we confess this morning that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. May we remember that. In Jesus' name, amen.